clarification first. I mean, uh, um, my name is Fernand. I'm from the Philippines. I'm a PhD student here in NCTU. And uh, you, how to begin? Because you really so, you talked about so many things. You talked about art, you talked about museums, but you also talked about economy and crisis. And um, interestingly, our class, before you, you had this lecture, talks about um, we discussed issues on, um, for example, you know, Hannah Arendt's uh, theorem on um, civil disobedience. And you also touched upon this issue, like you've shown uh, graffitis, which are, you know, this vandalism are a form of uh, this civil disobedience. But um, I would like to raise more of like a clarification. Like, for one, uh, what do you mean by, I might have missed it. I mean, of course, maybe you discussed it during the beginning of your presentation, but I want to have more clarification first, how you use the term avant-garde in this sense. Um, maybe um, in a more clear way, because um, of course we are English speakers, but as a second language, so maybe we can have more clarifications on that. Yeah. And. Um, Secondly, I was reading the introduction of your book, and I wanted to understand more on this issue that you raised about um, realizing the art upside down as an expanded participatory experience of economy. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of an interesting take on the um, perspective of a social scientist, because I'm not so familiar with art, but I'm familiar with Adorno's culture mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. but it might be more interesting or for the group to understand more and what you mean by saying an upside down approach when we talk about mm -hmm. participatory experience of economy mm -hmm. in relation to art and other parts. Mm -hmm. Sure. So two uh, relevant uh, questions or, or problematics. I mean, the notion of avant-garde is central to any discussion of the relationship between art and politics in uh, when we talk about Euro modernism or Western modern modernity. And the, the avant garde is uh, kind of like the, if we, if we follow someone like Peter Burger, for instance, the avant garde would be defined as, as, as the most radical segment of modern art. Artists realizing somehow that. The critical potential of modern art uh, cannot be fulfilled as artworks. That art, I mean, this, so this this is like a I'll try to make it into a short uh, explanation. But but this this has to do with the coming into to being of art as a um, as a modern phenomenon, which is for, which is of course a result of a of a complex historical development and the art institution in in, in some sense emerges uh, around, say, 1800, uh, where we get, we, we, we get a kind of separation uh, from, from, from um, where previously what uh, we, in retrospect, talked about as art was, of course, not art, but was different ways of symbolizing um, power for the church or for monarchs. But, but, but uh, due to the complex de-differentiation of modern capitalist society, we get um, a, a sphere in art, in, in, in life we call art, and art is characterized by relative autonomy. So um, art is no longer supposed to follow externally um, defined norms. So in that sense, the modern artwork is without any kind of destination. Before that, of course, there was a destination for what we, in retrospect, can call an artwork, but which, which, which is actually not an artwork, like Raphael or Leonardo da Vinci, etc. They were commissioned to paint pictures in churches and palaces, etc. But there occurs a kind of break when the modern art, art institution appears, and the artist is set free, so to say, and and um, and and the the, the, the modern work of art does not have a precise destination, but, but emerges in a kind of empty artistic public sphere. And this, is, this, this of course endows the artist and the artwork with a tremendous 
um, liberty or freedom. So the artist is, in, 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 a, in a certain sense, the artist um, can create the world anew whenever he or she enters the atelier. Um, but but what and that's that's in in, in in a shorthand that's kind of like that's the modernist art ideology that that art contains some kind of promise du bonheur a promise of happiness it contains pictures of a different world it can even critique kind of like uh, political problems um, there's a, there's a, there's a freedom in art and 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 uh, the artist is is uh, is uh, kind of like the incarnation of that freedom. But what the avant-garde, that uh, surrealism, the situation is what they what they come to understand is of course that the is, is of course that the freedom of the artist comes at the expense of the freedom of the spectator. The spectator is merely passively contemplating the results of the artistic process. Therefore, the the avant-garde is this extremely paradoxical endeavor where the artist somehow tries to negate him or herself liberating the, the, the expressive capability of the artist, setting it free to the spectator. So in, in that way the avant-garde is characterized by uh, still subscribing to the idea that art contains a, a transgressive potential, but only so far as art is no longer art, only in so far as art has become uh, negated or realized or I mean, set free and, be and become something different. And this, this is kind of like this is this is the paradoxical uh, self-understanding of the avant-garde, where the where where the avant-garde avant-gardeist artist somehow tries to realize the potential of art and tries to to kind of like go to the borders of and transgress the institutional uh, parameters of of art of the art institution. So we have. Marcel Duchamp trying to get a Pessoa exposed as an artwork, or Tristan Saar, the Romanian French art, uh, poet, composing poems by taking a newspaper and clipping the words uh, out and then putting them in a bag and then uh, kind of like replacing the, the, the notion of artistic genius with a, with, 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 uh, with a kind of uh, with randomness. Just taking up words and, and setting them together so that they constitute a poem. And of course what, what uh, Duchamp and, and Tristan Saint are trying to do is to, to question the norms and conventions of the modern art institution, asking um, what characterizes a, a work of art? What's the creative process? Uh, asking radical questions to the notion of artistic genius, for instance, etc. That would be that would be one way of trying to to define the avant-garde, uh, but this of course also means that the avant-garde there's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, the avant-garde has a has a particular is characterized by a particular kind of like I'm an art historian by, by training, but but and as art historians we often talked about the artistic avant-garde as as uh, being characterized uh, um, by what they're doing is that they're politicizing art. But in, in a certain sense, that's, uh, that's us art historians trying uh, or trying to analyze the, the avant-garde from within the art institution. Because they're, they're actually not trying to politicize art, they're trying to critique uh, the different spheres of of, of modern capitalist society, so they're not trying to to um, to, um, uh, to to bring art and politics together. They're actually trying. What they engage is engage in is a kind of revolutionary transgression of both the sphere of art as well as the sphere of politics. The Situationist would, would be the best example of of that. Uh, the Situationist try to distance themselves just as much from the, 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 the contemporary art institution refusing to, to, to do art shows or uh, in any way have any kind of contact with the established artwork but they also distance themselves from any organized political institutions because of course it's not a question of, of privileging 
the kind of like the, 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 the idea of, of activism or militancy or some kind of uh, political consciousness. The, the, the whole point is trying to transgress and supersede uh, the de-differentiation of, of, uh, of modern capitalist society. That, that life is, is, is split up, separated, characterized by separation. Um, so in that sense, it's, I mean, from within the perspective of the avant-garde, this, this, this is, this, this is, uh, this kind of like, this is, this is the, the, this is the attempt to somehow continue the revolutionary transition in a certain sense, uh, being a kind of, of, of both internal, external self-critique of uh, Euro-modernism or whatever we can call it. Um, that as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, I mean, <coughs> I can rephrase it, but, but that as, a, as an attempt to kind of like explain what I mean when I talk about the avant-garde. And then of course, the, the, what I'm arguing is that the avant-garde, I mean, following Peter Bürger, is in a certain sense, um, the, uh, it's implied in the modernist notion of art. And, it, and it's the radical self-realization of art. And, it, and, and I argue that it, it continues to haunt the contemporary art institution and contemporary art in different ways. Um, but that it, of course, also has to do with the notion of revolution. That's why, that's why I, I try to engage in a kind of materialist uh, art history, where I try to, to, to relate the question of, 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 uh, of, uh, of art I mean, to give an account of, of kind of like the, the present conjuncture. Or so, so uh, the avant-garde is this peculiar artistic or perhaps anti-artistic, anti-political stance um, that, um, uh, that, 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 that forces the very definition of, of art and the definition of, of, uh, of modernism uh, in, a, in, a, in a particular way. And the nightmare of the avant-garde is, of course, the, the second question is, the nightmare of the avant-garde is what Adorno and, and uh, Horkheimer uh, talked about when they talked about the, the culture industry. Because that is the, the realization, upside-down realization of, uh, of the avant-garde project, precisely the this, this strange setting free of the, the of kind of, like of uh, some kind of aesthetic dimension uh, within everyday life. Uh, I mean, the the, the, the as a as as as, uh, as as someone making commercials for new cars. So so kind of like surrealism connected from any kind of revolutionary or political uh, perspective, but but more as some as something that that's that's kind of like cool or selling cars or it's, 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 it's glorifying kind of like a, a new consumer society uh, and, and of course the I mean the this would be this would be kind of like the I can't remember that the exact uh, the quote there from the beginning but but this would be the the this on the one hand and then parts of Contemporary art, kind of like relative aesthetics, would be the the, con the contemporary version of the co of, of, of Adorno's analysis of the culture industry, uh, and uh, so this is the upside down realization of the promise of art, the promise du bonheur, uh, transformed into metaphysical marketing or uh, kind of like. The, the, the aestheticized world we somehow all live in thanks to uh, smartphones and computers and whatnot, where, where all of us are able to create, all of us have extremely powerful image machines at our disposal, but, but what, I mean, what kind of life or what kind of life forms are all of these uh, techniques of reproduction, are they producing? Of course, the, 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 uh, the analysis of someone like at all know probably uh, Guy Debord would be this is this, I mean, they are producing an, an extremely improved form of life, 
so, so this is the upside down realization of the avant-garde, where, where in a certain sense the, the, kind of like the, the creative capacity of the artist uh, has been has been set free, but, but with a view to consolidating capitalist life forms, uh, but kind of like the, 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 the basis, basic premise continues to be the commodity form or something like that. If that's, that's an attempt to answer. <laughs> I mean, I know it's really difficult to answer in a nutshell. I, this is very, um, it's a very long topic to discuss in a very short period of time. Uh, but I, I'm sorry, I mean. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, uh, does he uh, clarify your. Uh... It, it actually really answers the question briefly, uh, but it also reminds me of another form of, um, you know, this reproduction of images that creates a community. Like, for example, uh, I live in Budapest for one year, mm -hmm. and we visited a lot of um, state sponsored museums there. You know, and it, some, um, or not even museums, but communities mm -hmm. that um, produces uh, or that houses artworks that shows the daily life. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, how a socialist community should um, embody, uh, like, manifest a particular uh, component of labor, for example, you know, mm -hmm. the, all this kind of stuff. Which reminds me, of course, I know you talk about capitalism in this sense, like um, the crisis that are also involved in this. Um, you were discussing about Wall Street earlier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, in the same way, um, I'm, I, I also understand it's not part of your discussion earlier. But what do you think about this kind of materials, like especially in the other side of the world? Um, I, mean, I would, if, if I understand your question, I mean. My reading of contemporary art would be actually, I mean, it's, uh, I'm glad to bring up critical theory or Adorno, would be like Adorno, uh, Herbert Marcuse uh, inspired, arguing that, 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 that modern art, but also contemporary art, contemporary art continues to be characterized by a doubleness. So, of course, on the one hand, art still uh, functions as a specific sphere in which it's possible to to put masses to discussion where it's actually it's possible to to present political representations of i mean what, what you know from trump to uh, whatever uh, everyday life uh, poverty migrant crisis you know everything can become a topic uh, within contemporary art uh, so art continues to be a sphere uh, that's important, and, and then, then, there's no question. I mean, I'm an art historian, and I've been involved in contemporary art since uh, the 90s. Uh, contemporary art has, in that period, and uh, I mean, probably since the the, the uh, at least since the early 80s, in the in, in, in the US and uh, in Western Europe at least, it has actually functioned as a kind of substitute left-wing public sphere. As, as, as uh, in, the, in, the, in the historical period where uh, it has be become more and more difficult to advance in a kind of, of more coherent radical critique of I don't know, neoliberalism or or whatever, uh, in a broader public sphere, parts of that discussion has tended to seek refuge within contemporary art. So that's, that's kind of like, that's the positive reading of the function of contemporary art, that contemporary art has actually been a place where it's been possible to engage in discussions that have had a hard time elsewhere and in broader public spheres. But of course, the, the, the other part of the dominance of contemporary art following Adorno and Marcuse, Marcuse, would of course be that, that these discussions precisely take place within the limited sphere of contemporary art and within the kind of like the institutional parameters and in the suspended form that any discussion takes place when it takes place within the institution of art. Uh, and this of course brings us back to, the, to kind of like to the, the, the paradox of the avant-garde. 
that has to do with the institutional limits of art. Uh, this, this would be kind of like when Marcuse, uh, I mean, Adorno talks about uh, the culture industry uh, in the uh, in 1944, 1945, in, in the Didaktik der and, and uh, in 1936, Marcuse writes his text about uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, the affirmative character of culture. So he's trying to account for this, this doubleness or the duality of culture or, or modern art. And uh, I think that could, that, that that remains a, a, like a, a, a relevant framework within which to to talk about art. Also, because the the, the point for Marcuse and Adorno is, of course, that they 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 uh, continue to talk about art um, outside a more limited art historical or uh, literary historical. Framework, so it, it's it's right away also a question that has to do with politics. Okay. Other question, comments? Well, I could raise a question not related to art, but more related to the topic of economy and class struggle that you have been also mentioning. I wrote it down so I could <laughs> be more precise at the time of asking. So during the Occupy Square movements in Spain and the US, for instance, the working class was mobilized, actually. I agree with that. And parties like Podemos or uh, Sanders in the US, they came to represent this dissatisfaction. And um, then we started to call out them populists. And populism became the word of the year. But a few years after, I mean right now, another sort of populist parties uh, have taken the domain of the political scene. Trump in the US, for example, Vox recently in Spain, uh, many other far-right parties in Italy, France, and Germany, I guess as well, right? Surprisingly, the, the working class has also widely supported these parties that claim to defend the rights of the forgotten people, mm -hmm. promising more sovereignty for the state against the global economy, and also against immigration. That is maybe the main difference versus left-wing populist parties. My question is, since, for example, in the last election in Spain, we have seen how Podemos voters have decreased, while Vox voters have increased, could we talk about that transference of working class voters from so-called left-wing populist parties to so-called right-wing populist parties? What would you think about this? <laughs> yes. Um, well, you should you, you be here on Friday. <laughs> when I, uh, on Friday, on Friday I, I, I talked about um, another book uh, I, I wrote last year called Trump's Counter-Revolution. Um, where many of these issues uh, are analyzed in different ways, but but uh, I mean, uh, it's it's a super relevant and, and really important question. Um, the, the 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 analysis I propose in that book, the counter revolution of Trump, Trump's counter revolution, is to argue that Trump but also related phenomena in, in, in Europe should be seen as a as preventive um, counter revolutions against the coming into being of what uh, I think is, is, is a larger global viable protest movement, which of course then would, would, would include uh, the Arab revolutions, uh, the South European square occupation movements, Occupy, but also events in Chile and Canada, many other places, uh, really Boo uh, and the um, city in, in, uh, in France, um, in an attempt to prevent the coming into being of a, of a more radical stance. That, that's, that's the way I think we should, we should view things like Brexit, Trump, Fox, etc. 
And of course, what they are, what they're doing is that they are they're presenting themselves as a protest, as a genuine protest, the protest against the system. So Trump is a Trump of Vox. Um, they are protests, but protests against the protests, against the genuine protests. But what they are, of course, capable of mediating is genuine uh, disbelief in the system. So this, this of course, has to do with, with, the, with the financial crisis, but also a 30 or 40 year long of political economic development, where in most uh, Western European cases, and, and at least uh, also very much uh, that's the case in, in the US, real wages have been falling, the, 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 the welfare state that was established after the Second World War has been slowly been deteriorating. So kind of like the, the truth of Trump or Vox or these right wing populist movements is of course that, 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 that the political establishment or the political system has been failing and has been failing for at least 30 years in the form of, of some kind of neoliberal adjustment programs. And that, that's that's, that's the, the kind of like the, the political economic background for this strange the phenomenon of Trump or Vox or Salvini or Marine Le Pen, etc. Um, so they are, they, are, they are a symptom of um, kind of like the, a, an ideological breakdown in the case of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is no longer able to reproduce itself as, it, as, it, um, as, it, as was the case in the 80s, 90s, and zeros. And Trump or Vox, etc., are holding patterns, trying to prevent uh, the establishment of more radical perspectives. So, what they're doing is, of course, that they are somehow scrambling or upsetting uh, kind of like the, the viable protests that are going on in the streets. Uh, and they're trying to, to mediate them or channel them into a parliamentary situation uh, uh, into what I would call national democracy and the, 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 I would argue that, that the, uh, the protest movements to a large extent have actually already made the national democracy obsolete and, and that would be my uh, reservation towards uh, phenomenon like Podemos or Syriza or Bernie Sanders etc that I think that they, that they have missed the opportunity that was present actually in the square occupation movements, etc. That, that, that because there, there is no longer a connection between the street and the parliaments. The parliaments, the only, the only function of the parliaments are to derail what's actually going on in the streets. That, that, that's why I would, I would, I would be very reluctant to, to kind of like then oppose right-wing populism was a kind of left-wing populism. I think that's the trap. I think that's... Uh, I, wouldn't go down, I wouldn't go down that road. Um, and I also think that the, the problem with, with uh, that way of, of uh, conceptualizing uh, the divisions is that it, it tends to uh, consolidate um, kind of like the... the uh, Problematic ways, um, some some some, some, um, some suspicious ways in which we talk about, for instance, also the working class, where I would argue that that uh, uh, for instance it's the same in Denmark. In Denmark, we have a like a like a right wing party called the, the Danish People's Party, who have been uh, the, the third or second largest party since the early zeros, so for a very long time, and they of course presented themselves as kind of like the voice of, of the forgotten people, uh, and and they, they they have also kind of like presented themselves as we are actually the working classes. I mean, we, we give voice to the working class because the political elite in Copenhagen they've just they've forgotten about them, and they are funding uh, silly operas and modern ballets and. We, we live in we live far away from the, 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 the capital. We don't want uh, we don't want to spend money on that. And how come they are, that they allow migrants into the country? Uh, but of course, if 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 we were to make any kind of Marxist class analysis, we would say that the working class in Denmark is perhaps not necessarily a, a, a some uh, pensionist who, who some someone on uh, 
someone whose dad worked in, in a factory, it's probably more likely the Romanian or Polish uh, guy who's collecting strawberries in the fields. I mean, it's just as much work.